Hello and welcome. We are coming to you live from Washington, D.C., Enterprise Data World. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, The Chief Data Officer's Agenda. This month, John Ladley and Tony Shaw will discuss what data strategists are talking about after attending this week's CDO Vision Forum. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDO Data Strategy. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning project management, improving IT organizations and successful implementation of information systems. As president of IMQ Solutions, he leads a consultancy focused on improving a client's business results through information management and data governance. You can also check out his blogs on dataversity.net. And moderating today's discussion is Dataversity's own CEO, Tony Shaw. Tony is, of course, responsible for the business strategy of the company and its subsidiaries, including dataversity.net and all of the others, which in, um, all of which conduct in, conduct educational conferences, training, and publishing activities focused on the area of enterprise data management. Of course, I trip over the description of our own company. <laughs> That's all right. I do it all the time. And with that, I will hand it over to Tony and John to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thanks a lot, Shannon. And um, it is it is uh, kind of funny, actually, to all be sitting here in one room today around a table uh, when normally we're in our respective offices in different corners of the country, but uh, it's nice to be doing that for a change. Um, welcome, everybody. So um, just a little bit about what our, our plan is for today. Um, we've been at the Enterprise Data World Conference here in Washington, D.C. Uh, since Sunday. Uh, part of that program is uh, the, uh, the CDO Vision Conference, which was held on Monday and Tuesday. And um, between those two events, there's almost a thousand people have been here this week in Washington. Um, we've had very senior representation at the conference this year, uh, at both portions of it. Um, we've got at least 14, 15 chief data officers by that name uh, in attendance, organizations from government to um, uh, to healthcare, financial, um, publishing. Um, it just it, it runs the gamut, and so uh, it's been very interesting to us this week uh, as the role of the chief data officer becomes more and more prevalent to see the different perspectives that folks in each of those different types of organizations bring to the table. Um, certainly there are some commonalities, there's plenty of uniqueness about them, um, but what we're going to try to distill for you a little bit today are uh, the conversations that we have had during the week, uh, both formal in terms of presentations, for example, from the CDO Vision Conference, uh, as well as some of the informal conversations, the things that if you've been to industry events before, you know they tend to happen late at night at the bar or over dinner or around the lunch table. So. Um, I, I think different things come out in each of those contexts. Um, Shannon, introduce you to John Ladley. Um, welcome, John. Good to uh, good to see you this afternoon. Nice to be here live. Yeah. Um, let's uh, let's get going. I'll, I'll just explain very briefly the format of the meeting that we uh, have been in, so that uh, the folks who weren't here can just get an understanding for how the conversation was conducted. We, um, at the CDO Vision Program, we invited uh, three speakers to talk to different topics and then followed that up with a, an extensive moderated conversation. Uh, we had five topics over a day and a half and uh, those topics were competing with data strategy, uh, advanced analytics and data science, we talked about governance, risk, and security, 
innovation and monetization, so data innovation and making money with data. And then we talked about organization and structure, which was mostly focused around the role of the CDO and how to optimize a, a data-focused uh, organization or data, data management organization. So um, it was a wide-ranging discussion. Um, and I have to say that the thing that was that impressed me is, is how consistently business focused the, that conversation was. Um, I think there were barely two slides in the entire, uh, what did we have, 18, 20 presentations right, that mentioned right. any sort of technology at all. But John, let me just open up by asking you for your general impression about the, the key themes over the course of the two days. Uh, yeah, well, I'd say key themes um, and some of the things that we'll uh, probably dive into here during the, the conversation. I, I think, you know, if, if you pin me to the ground and say, what are three things that you uh, heard consistently? One, it would be that more discussion is around the operational aspects and the day in, day out aspects of information management and Therefore, the CDO uh, business alignment and benefiting the business. And then the, uh, I would say the third area would be, um, uh, it's a toss up. Uh, I'm gonna go with um, the, the importance of a CDO and still some of the debate about, about that, uh, that role. You know, within that, there's some of our talks you can see there on the agenda, but those are the three things that, you know, really stand out to me as, as, as hearing consistently, especially from the questions from the audience and things like that. Sure. And and if I was to name three, I'd put the alignment one at the top of the list. I think that was just super consistent. Um, I, I think what was um, uh, interesting to me with the, the number of conversations I heard around um, monetization, perhaps not in, this, in the sense of pure, you know, how to turn data into a product, which we certainly talked about, but um, some of the ways in which organizations are looking to leverage the, organize, the, the data that they have to turn it into some sort of unique competitive advantage. And, and again, we'll get into the conversation a little bit later. Um, and then in terms of the role of the CDO, I just, the, the consistent message I heard there was um, about defining strategy, uh, about you know, turning what, finding what it is about the data in the organization that, that um, can be turned to advantage, making that consistent, bringing, bringing order to chaos. Uh, I guess that's more than three things, but uh, you know there was there was just great consistency across the CDO roles in those areas. And then depending on the individual organization, they would have perhaps more specific things that relate to them. But those were the, the commonalities across all of them. Yep. Yep. Um, so let's, let's talk for a minute then about the state of the CDO, uh, state of the chief data officer and, and what we heard about that. Um, do, you, do you have a few observations there? Well, uh, one I heard of, uh, um, a little bit during one of the talks and offline was that there is already some churn. And when I asked what was that about, it wasn't um, what the, the type of churn we attribute to CIOs. Right? The old joke, CIO stood for career is over, right? <laughs> and, and, and the average tenure in the 90s uh, and the 2000s, it was about two or three years for a CIO. Um, there's been some churn in the in the first wave of CDOs, um, but the reason has been uh, them moving on to another CDO opportunity, which indicates a lot of dynamics in in that market. It also indicates uh, of some of them were also burnout that the job was in, it, it was a huge leadership position in some of the roles and really demanded enormous amounts of time. Uh, and and uh, the, the position itself was probably defined more narrowly than what it ended up being, and, and, it, and it, it stressed the people. Uh, uh, 
too, uh, too, too much. So that's yeah. In terms of in terms of churn, it was interesting to me how many CDOs had reported to multiple yes. senior executives over yeah. the previous six to twelve months, or or at least in the first six to twelve months of the establishment of that yep. that role before it settled into a place. So it was. It was obviously very difficult to find the right place for this role. Yeah, that, for a lot of yeah. that's an indicator that, that the organization itself wasn't really sure what that person's going to be doing. They they know right. they needed to do something, um, and and that's probably where some turns coming from because the role right. has changed, redefined, and then if you, someone ends up in a role that will wait, it's not what I signed up for, and they go and they and they go somewhere else. I I, I would say bottom line, it's indicative of just the. We're at that early stage. Of yeah, that. I, I agree. Um, now, at the same time, I throw the metaphor to um, to CIOs. It, it was pretty consistent that the CDO, the CDO, for the most part, does not report to the CIO. Yeah, and that was really interesting. We had a question. Remember the question for Peter Aiken's survey, which was right. his experience, which was older than ours, and the answers were entirely opposite. Right. CDOs report to CIOs. And then we went, no, they don't. So right. was, I thought and that barely, was barely a year and a half, a barely half, 18 months and difference between moved the forward yes. uh, dramatically in that amount of time. Yes, I some thought of that them, was really good. Some of them, um, well, in financial services, a lot report into um, functions like risk management. But um, in other organizations, uh, it's a direct line to COO. Uh, or in some cases, um, if the emphasis is more on analytics, then it's it's a report into yep. the chief marketing officer, perhaps. But um, yeah, there was remarkable consistency. So, so I, one of the memorable conversations that got a lot of um, generated a lot of buzz at the time was when somebody made a very strong point that if the CIO was doing their job, and they they were reflecting on an experience dealing with their CIO, uh, that there was absolutely no need to have a CDO. Right. And a self-selected group, granted, but that got shut down pretty quickly yeah. um, for a number of reasons. Uh, a couple of I remember right off the bat were that you know, simply the volume of, of activity. I mean, just because data is, is an electronic representation or you know, of information doesn't necessarily make it a technology topic. So, right. and therefore, you know, but this notion that this, the CIO, the Chief Information Officer, should somehow be prepared to deal with all of the business data needs of the organization, given where most CIOs are today, um, was, was largely shut down. I, yeah, yeah, it, the discussion was fairly intense. Um, and it actually it reflects what's been in a lot of literature lately. A few of the analyst firms have made uh, fairly profound uh, statements about the CDOs uh, lately, um, in, in, in some cases uh, roundly criticized and uh, not very well researched in some opinions. But um, And it was basically came down to that if the CIO had done their job, you wouldn't need a CDO. And that might have been true uh, 10 years ago, but I, I you know, I, again, what we came up with was the, the aspect that there's too much happening now for even one person to do that and handle infrastructure and handle applications. And uh, it's, it's, it, you know, it's a different argument than it was two years ago as, as well. So, so I think that's uh, an important point yeah. there. So, um, uh, there was a, a, a perfect single slide here uh, that uh, Ursula Catone from KeyBank mentioned. It's got four bullet points about why hire, why should you hire a, a CDO? Why, when do you need a CDO? And so I'll read the four points out to you. The first one is, are you investing in data but you don't seem to be making traction? Second one then was, do you struggle to get consistent? answers to important business questions. And she is the classic example of how many customers do we have, how they struggle with a wide range of answers over that. Uh, are you in a regulated industry? That goes, of course, to the compliance and, and 
governance uh, needs driven by data? And then does your company want to be more analytically driven? So um, I think that's a, a pretty nice summary of the, the themes of the conversation you know, that we heard uh, with emphasis in, in one area or another, depending on what sort of organization you're in. Yeah, and here's a couple more other before we move on, uh, wrapping this up. The, the, there was a few remarks about being very, very visible, uh, but not being taken seriously at the uh, initial table. Uh, and and we heard that uh, during our, our survey last year in our one-on-one -on -one conversations where they, the CDO shows up at the leadership table and, and it's, it's kind of like the new kid on the baseball team. Nobody trusts them, right? And, and it takes some time to get taken seriously. And that goes into the last bullet point where everyone who is a full-time CDO or has that top data job uh, says it's a lot of work. It, it, it's, it's a hard job. It's a challenging job. And I, and I, uh, which is good. That's what a leadership role should be after all, right? Yeah. So there's a question from an audience member, Dan, here. Uh, that suggests that perhaps most CIOs today should be retitled uh, Chief Technology Officer and leave the information and data management to the CDO. Um, of course, there are CTOs in many organizations already, but yeah. this, this was actually a, a asked in a similar context during the discussion we had on Tuesday. Um, uh, I have my own opinion on that, but uh, any any well, I, I have my own opinion, but the, the audience was uh, um, uh, acknowledged that that is a possibility. But at the same time, uh, when we had a, a related lively discussion about, um, well, it shouldn't be chief data officer because you're really managing information too, but, oh, well, heck, chief information officer's already taken, so what do you call it? And, and, and uh, um, no, well then, well, we can't use CTO either because that's taken. So, um, it, it uh, um, I, I think what the, the the fallout of that discussion is that that is definitely food for thought. That if your organization is such that uh, moving the information and the data management over to the CDO and leaving technology wires and pliers to the CIO, fine. But then there's also applications. There's also database. There's also privacy security. Uh, um, I think a lot of that depends on your specific circumstances and what you want to title that. I, I, the back at the end of that conversation, we went to Tom Redmond's firm that he coined. You know, the top data job, right? Right. That's really what we're talking about here. Right. And it's less about the label than yeah. the function. It's more about the function. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I don't want to do this CIO topic to death, but um, it, I think the conversation around the relationship between the CDO and the CIO was important, and that yeah. also got a lot of a lot of interest. So um, some of the CDOs said there was a rivalry, and it was a difficult for them, and some said there was great cooperation. Mm -hmm. And, I, and it's really interesting to have the rivalry that that also increased the difficulty of their job. Sure. And the CIO was saying, I don't need you. I've got this candle covered. But you know, now that speak to one thing for just advice to the audience, and that is, uh, especially if there's an executive out there listening or a CIO or a CDO or, or someone thinking about creating that position. You know, if you create that position and, and don't vet it with your team and prepare your team, that's pretty – pretty uh, mm -hmm. deficient leadership. I mean, you're going to bring a brand new executive role to the to the table and, and, and not prepare the table or tell them what they're supposed to be doing. And, in, and you're just, you're being very reactive. Uh, and you've got to be yeah. careful about that. That is a, very, that is a big caution out, out there. Um, but it was a lot of debate on that topic. And, I, you know, as I said, we could talk about that one for a while. We've got some other stuff, though, here. Yeah, I, I would agree there was debate, but I think pretty clearly the, the consensus was that that relationship is absolutely critical to the success of the CDO role. Because without the technology support, I mean, it's a business function, but it's it's a business function that's very reliant yeah. on technology, to, in most cases, to, um, to get the job done. Although there were a couple of great examples. In fact, um, 
uh, I'm going to have to pull this from my memory rather than my notes, but um, there was an example that Jennifer Ippoliti used to describe the, the need for a CDO separate from a CIO when she talked about uh, a particular situation that came up when she was back at Lehman Brothers. Right. And they're trying to solve a problem that really was more process oriented than it was. It, it had nothing to do with technology. It wasn't about changing the technology in order to solve the problem. Um, but uh, it, it was about the processes that surrounded the data and it had to be solved from that standpoint. It, it, it didn't have to be solved from the standpoint of any technology solution. Um, so I, I'm sorry I didn't make better notes about that one at the time, but um, that, that one sort of shut down the argument in the end, I think. Was. Yeah, but that was also uh, one of the examples where the, there was a real disagreement between the CIO and the CDO because the CIO was, well, we've got it covered, but it wasn't a technical problem. Right. And at least I, I believe it was being covered as a technical problem. Right, exactly. Yeah. So um, let's move on a little bit. Um, uh, maybe talk about the evolution of the role because it's, it's unfolding, it's developing so quickly that, uh, you know, what, what we know about it right now could, could, might not be applicable at all in, in yeah, well, I mean, a year yeah. or two years. <clears throat> Absolutely. When you, you know, they're reporting to multiple people. Um, uh, for example, shifting responsibilities. I heard here for the first time officially, which is something that has been, I've seen dabbled in, is the role of the CDO and the legal relationships of the enterprise mm -hmm. in terms of uh, contracts and intellectual property and uh, which, you know, including trademarks, service marks, things like that. That, that in many cases is an asset that's on the balance sheet. And uh, uh, we had a, a lawyer speaking who said that the CDO knows a lot about these things and could keep companies from getting into just bad agreements uh, on, on things that affect uh, data. So there is something new uh, popping up. Um, the evolving, we touched on this earlier, so I'm not going to belabor it, but there is still a questioning of the need for a role. Uh, we've seen that even in the analysis community and in the, in the Twitter sphere. Did I say that right, Twitter sphere? Okay. Twitterverse. Uh, Twitterverse. Oh, okay. I thought it was a sphere. Anyway, the Twitterverse. Uh, but uh, um, uh, at the end of the day, though, the, the role's becoming quite uh, solidified. Still in highly regulated institutions, content rich or organizations that monetize data on a day in, day out basis. But we are starting to see an awful lot of pressure for a top data job uh, in other uh, industries. And as we predicted, that's, uh, they're starting to pop up in, in, in other industries. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to borrow uh, another one of Jennifer's uh, slides here. She talked about five flavors of CDOs. And um, some of these exist now, some, I, I, you know, to, to varying degrees. There are those that are developed out of a need for regulatory compliance and keeping the CEO out of jail. There are those that are driven by uh, data quality issues, you know, things are broken um, and, and need to be fixed, so that need becomes pretty clear. There are others who are driven by uh, governance policy type questions, you know, data's out of control, we need to, to uh, get a handle on it, we need to get better decisions made, and we just don't know how to wrangle that data. Uh, there are those who are really focused on revenue generation. You know, how can we use the data that we have to to be creating new products or cross-selling or upselling um, to clients? And then, um, you know, the cutting edge would be the big data and analytics-driven CDOs who are um, sort of oriented towards data science, perhaps, or you you know, what can we measure and and analyze in order to make the business better? So. Uh, there's numerous directions for CDOs, I think, you know, might be interesting. Maybe we'll be asking our, ourselves the question in another three or four years about, um, uh, you know, what, what's the other title for CDOs? What, what happens when the CDO runs out of bandwidth? Um, you know, yeah. there, there's certainly a move towards chief analytics officer, for example. Right. Um, chief analytics officer for Kimberly Clark was here, Robert F. Eight, and, um, you know, he's essentially the chief data officer, but he's, he's very analytics driven. Mm -hmm. yep. 
Well, again, I think it's function and forget the title. Yeah. You know, it, it really is, is, uh, um, and crafting it for yourself. Crafting, you know, you know, what do you need? The thing is, the information is an important asset. It needs high level oversight and the CIO doesn't, in a large organization, pretty much does not have the bandwidth to do that anymore. So yeah. that's, that's what, it, what is what it boils down to. I'm, I'm glad you brought up, uh, the, lawyer that we had in the room because he, um, you know, he was not a, a, a data guy necessarily. No. Um, and, you know, most of the time when we sit around talking with data people, then uh, I guess what was in line? Are we back up? All right. Yep, sound okay now. Can you now? hear me now? <laughs> All right. So, Yay. Yeah, so I was just about to say that uh, the attorney was, was offering advice on auditing outsourcing contracts uh, to ensure that when things go wrong, there's yeah. some appropriate remedy. And um, they disconnected so, us because we didn't pay the bill. Yeah. Uh, but it was, um, I, I guess the point to make here is it was just so valuable to have an alternative point of view in the room because, right. you know, you get so myopic about um, the, the sort of conventional wisdom in, in whatever field you have. And then when somebody else comes in with uh, a few alternative points of view on things, it just shakes everything up. It, uh, and it, and it, there was a sidebar after that that uh, you weren't around. Um, I had happened to do a talk to a room full of attorneys uh, at a legal conference uh, two or three years ago. And uh, while I was doing my talk, the room, everyone was whispering to each other. And uh, normally that makes me really nervous because that, you know, means I've got lettuce in my teeth or something like that. But um, it turns out that what they were talking about was uh, this is, uh, this is amazing. We've been worried about this. We're talking about this. We're trying to convey to our uh, CEO client or our, our board of directors that we're advising or something that these are issues. And here's this person coming from, in their perception, the world of technology being just as concerned, all that. And then we have an attorney who is not specifically in the field saying things that are incredibly relevant. Uh, to the field. So uh, that's another one of those sidebar things that, that through the whole theme of actually this whole EDW event, that that uh, the data disciplines, the data risk management, all of the drivers we've talked about for a long time are really going mainstream and going mainstream very, very, very fast. You know, because yep. you've got the, the legal profession is coming up square and even with the concerns of enterprise architects and information architects now, which mm -hmm. is which is pretty cool. Which is yeah, pretty cool. yeah. Bill had uh, Bill. Um, ten, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> Bill Tenenbaum was the lawyer who was who was there, and uh, he had a laundry list of what he saw as hot topics for legal. Uh, yeah, you know, legal topics and arguments around data. Um, privacy was one of them, of course. I mean, that's sort of an obvious one, but um, data ownership was another one, and yep. he, he was hot on that. Um, uh, you know, when, it, when are you able to sell the data that right, you own or, or not, um, which, you know, is a surprisingly well, complex. For, for our listening audience's pleasure, he said, the minute you begin to think about, can we do something with this data? 
you need to be a lawyer. Are we allowed to do anything with that data? Right. Plain and simple, everything. Have that, start to have that mindset. Yep. And that, that is so different than something we might have talked about 10 years ago or five years ago. Yep. And I, a little one liner from him, because we started talking about you know managing data as an asset. Yes, data is an asset, but only if the contract says so. Yeah. <laughs> so and that's a lawyer to you. Yeah, so and, and you can be cynical about that, but uh, what he's reflecting is you know, his experience in intellectual property. Yeah. Um, obviously, we're not talking about – talking about slightly differently, um, semantically differentiated versions right. of, of what an asset is, but um, yeah, his uh, – I guess his point was, you know, there's a lot to think about. There's going to be a lot more to think about in terms of the legal framework that surrounds the, the management, the sale, the the, yeah. the asset management of data. Well, I, I, sure. about, I guess about four years ago or so, I started talking about retention and, and data life cycles and getting rid of data. And I said, you know, the debate between the lawyers and the analysts are going to, it's going to get strong. And here he went and just independently from listening to me, because I'd never met the person before, right. said that if the law says you can get rid of the data, then you get rid of the data. If you still think you need it, then you have to reduce that data to those things that you need. But anything that has a statutory risk to it, it's gone. So you just don't keep everything in the salt mine in case you might use it. You have to bring it back in, parse it out, keep what you want, and ship the rest out. And, and I just thought of this just now. It just popped in my head. It's kind of like a late life cycle data filtering, ETL, you know, ETL to go off into the data graveyard kind of thing. Um, and, uh, again, with, we're getting some of these new cool things of, of what we need to do popping up uh, because of this, uh, again. Right. And yeah. and the previous afternoon, um, talking about data science, we were basically talking about keeping everything forever in case you might need it someday yes. Yes. and be able to do some sort of interesting analytics okay. on it. And the lawyer's going to look at you and say, I can't think of any good reason to keep everything every day. Right. For uh, Everything forever then. Yeah. Right. So we had a couple of good conversations about operationalizing data yeah. governance, in particular, um, uh, Jacqueline from um, from HSBC and Bob from uh, from Navian just gave us a real good dive into the governance and stewardship yes. processes. Um, what were your takeaways from that, John? Well, uh, um, for those out there working on data governance and, and stressing out that it's never going to work, it is working. Uh, you know, as a consultant, one thing I run into all the time is the consultants, uh, the customers saying, "Yeah, but is anybody really doing this?" And the answer is an absolute resounding yes, and they're being successful uh, with it. Um, uh, you know, um, Navian, for example, has uh, great sustaining techniques. They were talking about uh, recognizing the stewards and uh, sending personal letters to stewards who've done a good job. And, and those are things you go, oh, well, that's kind of folksy, folksy, cheesy right. or something. Well, you know what, if you go to any other aspect in an organization where someone is does really good at the sales campaign, they get a personal letter from the boss yeah. and, and, and a little bit of a perk. You know what, this is normal, good human capital practices. Right. This, well, I don't know why anyone in our field is like, oh, that's really cool, that's surprising. That means we're just, a, we've been a bunch of HR stumble bums, you know, for the last 30 years. Well, what a great idea, say thank you to somebody. Whoa, what a novel concept. But. Um, but there's these motivations and novel. I, I talk offline to someone about uh, rolling out their program, and they uh, base their entire success on making applications development happen. They'd heard somewhere from some crazy consultant that AppDev is a big resistance point. So they went out of their way to make AppDev happy through their governance and data management programs, and, and their success has been, has been uh, terrific on that. The other one good thing that we also, also heard, which uh, listeners need to take to heart, is is the ongoing training. You never stop pulling people in, telling them what's going on with the data, keeping them up to date. That is a prime, prime success factor we heard from all of these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and what really struck me when Jacqueline was talking, uh, you know, HSBC is a huge organization. And while well, they have 12 CDOs. 
or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's quite that many, but but um, uh, you know she heads up the Americas operation, and the level of of um, co comprehensiveness, I guess, um, uh, across that entire organization was just stunningly impressive. Um, you know, you, you kind of think in terms of starting small and, and building out and um, tackling things one one step at a time, and, and they've just, uh, at least from the presentation, looks like they've got it all covered, mm -hmm. and they've thought everything yeah. through. And I, um, man, you know, as a best practice, yeah. uh, they they really set a great example. I was impressed. I was impressed. I was yeah. taking a lot of notes. That yeah. Time. Uh, well, in terms of, uh, of sort of getting enterprise coverage of something like that, there was this, this fun little conversation. At, um, I think, again, it was Jennifer Ippoliti from Raymond and James who came up with the, the word enterpriseify, enterpriseification. Um, and there was a serious point behind the, the chuckles that came out of that. Um, I know you were, you jumped on that one right away. Yeah, well, anyone who's, you know, I mean, uh, enterpriseification is a riff on a certain former president we've had, so, <laughs> right. and that's always uh, fun. Um, uh, uh, but the serious note was that, that, and uh, uh, it's another way to, it's a better way to say something I've said for a while, which is the E stands for enterprise. This really is enterprise-wide. You've got to keep that in sight. You are working cross-functionally. Uh, We've had a nice talk, remember, about breaking down silos. Mm -hmm. Maybe those are the wrong words. You do need silos to divide labor and have an organization be efficient and, and do efficient processes. But you need, you can't build silos without any type of, of uh, membrane between them where things can't flow back and forth. And, and that's a big job of a CDO, which is to, is to find ways to get these silos working across a common a matrix type thought. All right, yeah, you might be a silo functionally or process wise, but there is no such thing as a data silo. All right, you know, and, that, right. and their job is to, is, is to get to there. And that was a serious aspect of that. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I, I want to move on to the conversation that we had around um, innovation and monetization. Um, this is still sort of a a little bit of a vague notion to some folks. I mean, there there are a lot of companies that are. Easy, it's it's easy to see that they are a uh, a packager marketer mm -hmm. uh, of data. They they have a product they sell sometimes for millions of dollars. Um, you know, they're selling data as a product. For, but for most organizations who aren't specifically in those businesses, then it's it's kind of hard to see how they could do that because people want to hold on to their data. Mm -hmm. um, all that makes a lot of sense, but um, increasingly there are examples of organizations that are finding a way, maybe it's by opening up their data through an API of some sort, or maybe right. they publish a public data set and, and uh, have a hackathon to figure out, you know, how people can use it. We saw um, some presentations around designing uh, data products and designing data experiences, which were interesting to me. Um, by data experiences, what that means is, you know, how do people interact, interface with the data in such a way that, that uh, it provides enjoyment or benefit to them? And, you know, are there opportunities to monetize that? Maybe one example, um, easy, a simple example of that might be something like a Fitbit, uh, which is, you know, sensing and reading your signals, your body mm -hmm. signals all the time and giving you an easy way to interpret that. But um, then at at, um, uh, at dinner one night, I was sitting next to a gentleman from a transportation company, and he was telling me a story about a product that they're about to release. And, and this is a, a, a trucking company. Mm -hmm. And they're getting into the business of selling data. Absolutely. And... What they're looking at doing, for example, is creating a better uh, measure of economic activity. And this actually goes back to uh, Micheline's talk. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, a better activity, a better measure of economic activity by measuring 
uh, deliveries of goods. Mm -hmm. So just uh, you know, weight, volume, number of, of uh, packages, et cetera, and using that as a proxy for economic activity. And he said that the testing that they've done up to this point uh, has shown that this is a better, more immediate measure, a more accurate measure of GDP than the uh, government-generated statistics right. that end up being revised right. a couple of months later. He said, you know, we're within 5% every time or, or whatever it was, uh, 0.05 perhaps. Um, and, and so then they're going to, his organization is going to offer this data as an index for other folks to buy. Now, you know, that's, that takes some creative thinking to right. get to the point where, um, where you know, you can right. use the well, there's the old, the old ADP. A lot of people ignore the government employment numbers and use the payroll companies numbers, and that's been going on for a while. And then it just kind of sat quietly till all of a sudden, wow, we can do this. We also talked about property and casualty insurance companies monetizing the little gadget they want you to put in your car. Sure. Yeah, you know, and they won't have to, they they don't have to tell who's doing it, but they can they can uh, 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 sell that data to automotive manufacturers, to uh, accessory manufacturers, to energy companies. There's all kinds of parameters that are collected. Uh, by that. Uh, the, the key point was that everybody that's doing anything that's accumulating piles and piles of data can now be thinking about monetizing uh, the data, and that, that was a real key. And then, uh, uh, then during her talk, um, uh, I just had a brain cramp. The Federal Reserve, Micheline Kajaline, uh was talking about the lag in the Fed's data and here's someone else saying, well, we don't have that lag. We're, we can tell you what, every, what we delivered last week and what the economy is doing. And, and that's very, 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 very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody asked me uh, at the same dinner, you know, where I see the subject matter for the Enterprise Data World event being in mm -hmm. five or ten years, um, which obviously is a bit beyond my uh, predictive capability. But um, uh, I'd, I'd like to think that we're focused on those types of issues much more by then, then we are in talking about plumbing and and integration. I mean, I, I my sense is that over the past uh, perhaps the past five ten years, we've we've gradually lifted the level of conversation from technology specific stuff to a point now where you know we really have solid business conversations in um, in most of the sessions and. Our, our CDO program is definitely in that category. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me see. We're, um, well, let's go back to uh, let's go back to Micheline's talk because sure. I think um, this was really critical in, in setting the tone for the meeting. And um, perhaps the most quotable, albeit obvious statement, but um, you know, one of those things you kind of bunk yourself in the, the forehead with uh, when you hear it is she said. Data will never be as small as it is today. Uh, I mean, it's demonstrably true. Uh, and she felt strongly that whatever data we're dealing with today that we call big data is, is going to be, by definition, small data in about five years' time, so if not sooner. So um, this notion that that, you know, maybe you can, I don't know that anybody's seriously thinking they can ignore big data, but um, it's it's going to impact every aspect of data management in such a way that, um, you know, you can't, you can't, you, we're never going to go backwards, I guess. Uh, so, uh, but that, that was a launching pad for her conversation around how the Fed is uh, ingesting huge amounts of different types of information in order to get a better read on the economy, uh, on the health of different industries, on uh, you know spending, obviously, on investment, et cetera. Um, what sort of takeaways did you have from Micheline's talk? Uh, the, the big takeaway for me was the uh, uh, the 
acceptance of something that actually the Fed's been trying to do a long time, which is understand more and more about the economy and drive macro into micro. I hope I don't sound too much of an economist here, you know, but um, that's the first time I've used my degree in 35 years. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, and the fact that, and, uh, and the takeaway, uh, again, that big takeaway for me was that it's now pervasive. It's not just the Fed that's doing this. But now that challenges organizations like the Fed to kick it up another notch. Right. Now that you have all of this available below, you're no longer uh, – I remember doing research as a young financial analyst uh, and going to the Federal Reserve Library in St. Louis because that was the only place to get some of this data. Now there is so many places and there's so much input and so much to factor into the decision. The decisions – the decision processes, what I took away really about my decision processes, data that concern data or need data are going to be so different uh, and, and are literally changing by the year. Mm -hmm. I, 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 this business of predictive analytics and having uh, answers to questions you haven't asked, that's old. That's, we had that in data mining in the 90s. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's whole different paradigms of, of decision making coming up. And you can see that with all of the you know, from the way she was talking about how they were beginning to think. Yeah. So uh, we've talked quite a bit about the conversations that took place at, at uh, CDO Vision. John, what, from the broader conference, because there were 900 people here this week, yep. uh, what, what other hot topics did you hear that were of interest to you? Well, um, now, these, this is the, when you started the, our talk, you talked about conversations in the bar. Mm-hmm. So we have to qualify everything about to say that, <laughs> that these were in the bar, okay? And I, and I was just listening. I wasn't. Are they more or less relevant if they take place at 11:30 over? After several glasses of Cabernet, yeah. Right. So, but anyway, but I, I was not participating. I was listening. I was being a good journalist. So we'll. Uh, and he, he said tongue in cheek. Yeah, we'll uh, that one next time. All right. Okay. So. Um, uh, two big general themes from the whole conference. Um, that uh, at last, um, and you hear this from people who've been data architects for 20, 30 years, and, uh, and uh, you know, that uh, we had confirmation that we've gone mainstream. We've had confirmation that uh, organizations are taking this seriously um, and that we're real. But the second takeaway is in the next breath, I have to say, oh, my gosh, we're part of the business now. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit nervous about this. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of data architects now that are much more visible and have a bit more accountability than perhaps they're, they're comfortable with now, too. So there is a, a personal uh, – your personal interaction with the profession is changing. There was a lot of discussions about that. We even talk – the one data modeler that's really ever been successful, Graham, Right. So he did our talk. I think there's been more than one, but <laughs> come on. Well, you know, Graham's done well. Okay. But we were talking about how even the kind of modeling he did is reversed from what we're dealing with now. When he modeled, he was the only voice for enterprise wide stuff. The mod we could see the big picture back in the eighties and nineties modeling. Now most modelers are recruited out of school, have a narrow applications picture, and you have to train them for the yeah. big picture. It, it, uh, and, and the organization's gone upside down. And again, that was the big thing. The other one other thing, and I'll, we'll wrap up because we had two questions here, is that um, uh, the organization and the soft aspects. That was always something in the prior year. Someone would say, "Yeah, we really need to think about that." Uh, this year, the organization change presentation or themed presentations were really highly attended, um, and a lot of interest and a lot of senior people in those. Uh, and a lot of people are talking about the organization, the human issues, and, and, the, and those types of changes, too. Yeah. So I, I'm, uh, we'll get to the questions in just a second. Uh, after I agree with you wholeheartedly about, the, again, the business, business alignment issue, I think that kept coming through, whether it was amongst the data strategists and CDOs or at the data architect level or wherever it was, um, that came through consistently in not, you know, we used to talk about what people should be doing, um, 
but these conversations were about how it was aligned and how people were working together and, and the, that dynamic certainly seems to have evolved in a positive direction. Um, so let's just take a look at a couple of the, the questions here. Um, all right. I apologize, some folks seem to be losing the, the audio question, but there's one here um, uh, from Lane that asks, what's the primary business driver that you can sell to leadership to justify a CDO in a non-regulatory environment? Um, so let's say outside of healthcare, financial services, you know, what do you think is a good uh, rationale for, for justifying Sure. CEO role. Two, two really off the top ones. Risk isn't just regulatory. Um, um, uh, um, you, if you're in an organization that could suffer uh, reputation damage uh, or, or damage in your um, uh, um, book value from your stock, do a mm -hmm. reputation thing. You need to consider some type of functional top data job uh, uh, out there. Uh, the other aspect, the other one easy, is if there's any type of monetization you're considering in your data. The CEO said, well, I heard that the competing trucking company was doing this, and I want our trucking company to do that. You'd better get somebody that has the aspects, if not the title, some of the roles and functionality of a, of a CDO because yeah. there's an awful lot of you might end up with a lot more risk than you thought you had. Right. So you need somebody who can who can think strategically about the capabilities of the data that they might might uh, have within their their sphere of influence. Um, perhaps the, the data that needs to be added to that to, to add value to it, and who can who understands how to turn that into something through whatever. Uh, processes, be they technologically based or otherwise. Um, agreed. So um, uh, there, there was a second part or kind of a restatement of that, which I, um, I don't think is quite the same question, and I, I'd like to ask it anyway. What's the, what's the biggest value a CDO brings to an organization? Uh, it's going to differ by yeah. industry, of course. Right, right. But it's going to differ by the reason you thought you needed the CDO. Anyway, sure. if, I, I mean, if I have to be general on that, it's going to be um, uh, uh, well. You know, go back to the reasons that that, that uh, Ursula and Jennifer were talking about why they were CDOs. There were a lot of general threads in that, and and they and and they end up being uh, someone has to to oversee. Uh, uh, just like the CFO oversees the integrity of your financial situation, someone needs to oversee the integrity of your data situation. Yep. That's really the common thread. Now, and if an org, all different business models have different data situations, therefore, and that's why, therefore, a, a CDO, one comment we heard that CDOs are like snowflakes, no two are alike. Right. I, oh, and there's a reason for that, and the reason is that no two organizations are exactly alike uh, uh, either. So I would say that the value is uh, is um, uh, whatever the level, the importance of data is to your organization and whatever your market position is, the CDO is that assurance that you're going to not be deficient in that category. You yep. might be deficient in your marketing, you might be deficient in your processes or your financial management, but the CDO's job is to make sure at least data is not on that table of, of causing issues. Yeah, and in fact, if you if you want to make the comparison to other conventional assets, finance, you know, people, property, et cetera. You know, you want to have somebody in the role of, that's dedicated to optimizing the use of that of that resource or mm -hmm. that asset. Yep. Um, and that's something that the CDO can do. All right. Um, did we talk at all about the, what CEOs think about the role of the CDO? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Well, what we heard is, well, I don't think, maybe you heard something different. I didn't hear anything new. If they were highly regulated, they got a CDO because the CEO told somebody, I want somebody on that. 
and they ended up with a, a, a CDO. Um, I think, although we've got good traction in the industry, we've got good traction in data management. I heard a lot of comments this week that in the State of the Union address, the term information management was mentioned for the first time recently. Um, uh, I do think that the absolute top executive line are still more concerned with uh, the financial numbers, perhaps, uh, and uh, market position and reputation, and data is still delegated somewhat a minus one uh, level there. But the CEOs are delegating uh, the need or the request for, you know, I need fill in the blank here to tackle this issue, this problem, or this opportunity, and that person is yeah. becoming the CDO. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm going <clears> to <throat> answer that question. Um, my, my point of view is I, I think there's some evidence that uh, I, I don't see much evidence, and obviously I'm not privy to all of these uh, circumstances, but um, despite the churn in the role, I, I don't get the sense it's because all the CDOs are just being fired because they're doing a lousy job. I, mean, no. I think it's it's for other reasons related to the unique opportunities I, I specifically in the marketplace. Asked that. I, I yeah. you know, glass is half empty me. I said, okay, there's churn. Who's getting fired? And resoundingly, the group of us standing in a circle um, said, no, they're not, people aren't getting fired. They're moving around. Right. The, right. the number of new opportunities is right. multiplying so quickly, and most of the, the best of those jobs are looking for somebody who served the role before, many of the best of them, anyway. Right. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's true. In fact, so you and I made a prediction in our research just a few months ago, John, that the, the rate of increase in the role of the CDO was going to basically double every, not, not the rate of increase, but the number of CDOs was going to double every year to year and a half. It's kind of a Moore's law right, equivalent. Right, right. Uh, I'm not sure that we, we went off by a significant amount because I'm, no. I'm seeing two, three, four, five, uh, new appointments to the role of CDO every single day in the news feed that I get. That and I mean, whether that's a valid, I, I don't know. They're just the ones who are issuing press releases about it. Um, and the, the range of organizations is just so diverse. Yep. Um, some of them are tiny, some are humongous. And um, so I think we might have underestimated that. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be growing. I also think then on the the question that that begs is that some of these CDOs are, like the CIO was back in the 80s, going to be asked to work miracles in very short periods of time that they can't do. Yeah, there is going to be an elevation of expectations here, and uh, um, and there'll be a, a hiccup from that. Yeah, as I think well. I think this this might even be a uh, a. The thing that Gartner needs to make a new hype curve about is where is the CDO on the hype curve? Ah, uh, well, it's 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 climbing the uh, the left hand edge of it right now. Right. Uh, we're still not at the um, pinnacle. I, they have a a catchy, witty term for that. Um, right now, I know all of our other things. For example, data. We we drew this curve on a napkin at the aforementioned social occasion, and. Uh, um, Data management is coming out of the trough of disillusionment and climbing uh, to a, a general acceptance mode here. So the CDO is somewhere back on the ski slope with that. Okay. So there's a couple of questions we'll wrap up with. Um, I think we can give relatively short answers to them. How many people are you seeing uh, reporting to a CDO? Uh, I, some of the departments were as few as zero. Uh, right. some, uh, it often seems like the CDO starts out in a, a role under the sponsorship of another organization, essentially has no budget and has nobody reporting to them for the first year, and right. then it takes off from there. Even Michelle and Casey at the Fed had that situation. Um, you know, year one, she had nobody. Year two, she's got a $12 million budget and, and what was it, 40 people? Yes, yes. Um, uh, by the same token, somebody at dinner was talking about uh, Charles Thomas at Wells Fargo. Um, 
He has a budget of $500 million. Yeah. Can you uh, believe that? Well, they gave Charles, uh, I happen to know a little bit about that, they gave him everything. Uh, he got any any BI or any reporting or anything in the whole organization moved over to him from AppDev and all the other areas. Okay. So it'd be so, interesting to factor him into this this structure right. conversation uh -huh. again at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're talking about five to seven direct reports. Right. But then depending on how, I are, how they are, the number of people underneath really really can explode. You know, Wells Fargo is, 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 is an interest. Wells Fargo's bank is like HSBC. There's lots and lots and lots of people in that office. Okay. And then the final one here, and I'll touch on this because uh, it, it, it is topical, uh, about the role of the CDO in relation to recent cyber attack events. Um, in our research previously, we found that, that CDOs were not involved in data security, uh, but we did, one of the reasons we invited the lawyer that we mentioned earlier to speak was to talk about this uh, issue of legal liability um, under cyber attack. And um, so we did touch on it, and uh, I, I think the general consensus was that CDOs need to be consulted more um, on a yeah. range of security-related issues as they relate to data. Um, but the, the honest answer is we did not get into that in great detail. We did finish up the conference with a fabulous talk uh, about data security strategy, but uh, we are out of time at this point. We're going to have to wrap up, so that'll be something we come back with in future. It was it was a lot of fun. That's on later in the year. All right, That's on our calendar. Shannon, back to you. Thank you, Tony and John, for this great discussion and a review of the CDO Vision Forum. Um, and thanks to all of our attendees, of course, for participating. Just a reminder that I will be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information. Um, if you don't have it in your inbox by Tuesday morning, just give me a buzz and I will make sure and get that information to you. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending. Also, if you would like to see the video of the talks uh, from CDO Vision, those will be made available within the next two weeks. Late, uh, excuse me, two weeks, and I will get an email out to everybody letting you know as soon as those are available uh, for purchase. Hope everyone has a great day, and we will see you next month. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, John. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.